DRM, or digital rights management, is perhaps one of the worst things for consumers to deal with in the digital age. It is software that is developed strictly to restrict what the users can do with the software or the device that they purchased. Unfortunately, DRM is very commonly used amongst some of the biggest competitors in the technology space. Microsoft, Apple, Sony, and Nintendo are some of the most notorious companies that have implemented very strict DRM into their software and devices. And today we're going to take a look at some of the more sinister examples of DRM. Now, this isn't in any kind of order. In fact, this is mostly just examples that I thought of off the top of my head. So let's start with Microsoft. They've actually ramped up the amount of DRM in the Windows operating system over the years. One of the earliest and the most consecutive examples of DRM, because it's present in all versions of Windows, is the Windows Media DRM, which forced you to watch video and audio on Windows machines in such a way that the distributor of that content could control what you can do with it. Now this is mostly done to prevent somebody from sharing a movie or music from a CD. The history of Windows Media DRM is filled with Microsoft implementing the DRM in one way and then hackers figuring out how to crack it and then Microsoft comes back and they come up with a new way to implement the DRM as well as throwing a bunch of lawsuits around to push the hackers deeper underground and then fragment their groups by getting some of them sent to jail, making further development of the cracking of the software more difficult. It got so bad at one point that on Windows Vista and Windows 7, the media DRM would prevent you from running certain applications at the same time that you were playing a movie or listening to a CD that could potentially be used to record audio or video. And you could probably imagine how annoying something like this would be. Like, let's say, for example, you were listening to a song on a CD or some other media file that has these DRM protections, and then you open up Discord to talk to your friends. Well, back in those days of Vista and 7, you would have probably been using TeamSpeak. But anyway, you open up that application, but because it is able to record audio, the playback of your music suddenly stops. And when you try to play it again, you get a message saying, oh, you need to uh, disable TeamSpeak, or sometimes it might just give you a vaguer message and say that this file cannot be played right now. Pretty annoying. Now, funny enough, the pirated versions of media, they always have this DRM removed from them, which actually makes it more worth it in my eyes than the legitimate copies that keep the DRM intact since I can actually do more with the pirated content than I could with the content that has DRM embedded in it. Now, Microsoft enforcing DRM on behalf of different media companies is one thing, but what kinds of DRM do they use to actually lock down their own operating system? Well, besides the usual limitations that you have with proprietary software compared to free open source software like GNU Linux, Windows 10 would display the annoying activate Windows watermark above all applications that you run in Windows 10, and they would even restrict you from personalizing your computer and changing the desktop background, at least from the pre-existing backgrounds. You could still right-click on a picture and then set that as your desktop background. And Windows 11 actually took this a step further by keeping all of those same limitations, but then they force this crappy center start menu theme on you. And you can't change that unless you activate Windows 11 with a key. So Microsoft clearly knew what they were doing when they created this and when they required a license to change it. There is also the new TPM requirements for Windows 11, which are likely going to be used to implement some super DRM that's even more difficult to remove than what we've seen in the past. Now, another form of DRM that almost everyone has had to dealt with is printer ink. Printers themselves are pretty cheap when you actually consider the cost of manufacturing them. In fact, a lot of printers that you would go and buy in a typical big box store are actually sold at a loss to the printer company. 
but that gets made up by them over time by you buying ink. Part of the reason why printer ink is so expensive is because of DRM. You have to use specific kinds of ink with your printer, otherwise the cartridges simply will not work. So this prevents third-party manufacturers from selling ink at cheaper prices and means that very quickly you're going to end up spending more in ink than you did on your printer in the first place. Now another feature that most printers have, which I consider to be DRM just because of how difficult it is to disable it, uh, but it's more used for tracking purposes than actual digital restrictions. And those are the machine identification codes that almost all printers put on each piece of paper that's printed from them. So these machine identification codes, they're very small, faint yellow dots. They're smaller than one millimeter and you can't really see them with the naked eye. And what they do is they allow someone who knows how to decipher this machine code to figure out when a document was printed and from what printer it was actually printed from, even including the printer's serial number so that you could identify the exact unit. So obviously that's a pretty spooky thing when you think about it. You print something out and then anybody who gets their hands on that piece of paper, or even if they're just able to get a picture of that paper with a high enough resolution to be able to then see these dots, they would be able to know all of these details about when you printed it. And finally, we're gonna take a look at the world of gaming, which probably has some of the most sinister examples of DRM that I've seen. So back in the early 2000s, there was a kind of DRM called Starforce that was developed by a Russian company called Protection Technology. Now before Starforce, there were still many different kinds of DRM that were used in PC games that would usually come on discs. And the way that this DRM worked is it would require you to have the disc in your CD drive to play the game. And you can still see this kind of stuff on modern day consoles like PlayStations and Xboxes, where even if you install the game to the console itself and it's loading all of the game files off of the console's hard drive, you still have to have that disc in the tray. And the reason for this is to prevent somebody from just buying a game, installing it on their computer, and then they give that game to their friend, and then they install it on their computers or on their consoles as well. Now, while previous implementations of this CD-ROM requirement DRM were pretty easy to bypass for most games by downloading a no-ROM cracked EXE and then just running that, or sometimes you would have to download a patcher file that would go through and modify some of your different game files to then allow them to run without a CD. Starforce took this a bit further by encrypting all of the files that were on CD-ROMs that were using it and then using a unique key for each disk to decrypt it. And this key would be based off of small differences in the physical parameters of the disks themselves. So this DRM, this multi-tier DRM, was so effective that one iteration of Starforce on Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, it took over a year for hackers to crack it. But there is a darker side to Starforce's DRM, which is the fact that it would install several drivers with ring zero kernel level access to your system in order to actually handle this DRM functionality. Now, there's a number of reasons why this is a problem. For one, any application that's doing that is basically a rootkit, uh, especially when you consider the fact that end users were not even aware of what they were installing. They didn't even know that they were installing this Starforce drivers onto their system because no video game that ever used Starforce ever mentioned it in the EULA that you had to sign to install them. And even after uninstalling games that came bundled with Starforce, these drivers themselves would remain on your system. Starforce's DRM also didn't know how to handle PCs with dual CD and DVD-ROM drives 
because it would still check to see if a disc was in the tray. It used this system because, well, it was pretty good, but it just included multiple tiers of checking to prevent people from bypassing it. Uh, but anyway, if you had two CD trays, then the software would get confused because it's seeing that, oh, you have a tray that doesn't have the disc in it. So then it would tell you to insert the disc in the tray, even though you have it in the other one. So if you were running a dual CD slash DVD ROM drive setup, which uh, I know for some Zoomers out there who probably haven't even used a CD-ROM in their life, uh, they probably can't imagine that, but it was somewhat common back in the day. Uh, but if you had that, then you would have to disconnect one of those CD-ROMs or one of those CD-ROM drives in order to play a Star Force game. And there was another bug with Star Force that would disable direct memory access on the CD-ROM drive, as well as make it run slower. But this disable of the DMA would result in you being unable to play audio CDs on your computer without it blue screening. And again, because of how deeply Starforce embeds itself in the system, removing your game wasn't enough to fix it. You would have to then use a special Starforce removal utility for these specific versions of Starforce that you had installed on your system in order to fix it. And even then, there were some allegations that this software didn't always do its job properly either. So this is yet another example of DRM punishing the people who are actually following the law, the people who are trying to do what the game companies want them to do. They're buying the game legitimately, they didn't pirate it, and all of this is happening because these studios that are behind these games and that are behind the audio and video content that's being produced on DVDs, Blu-rays, CDs, etc., they would rather use some very buggy, highly restrictive DRM that, for all intents and purposes, is basically a rootkit. <laughs> uh, and it ends up punishing their fans, all to stop a few people from pirating content or from sharing content with their friends. It's all pretty ridiculous, but that's what you get with proprietary software, because the user does not control the software, so the software ends up controlling the user. What are some of the worst examples of DRM that you've experienced? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching the video. Have a great rest of your day.